I'm really, really excited to be here. Today I'm going to talk a little bit about um, thinking inside the box and the changing landscape of learning. Um, so thank you very much for the warm introduction. Hey, everybody. Um, here's kind of my bio in Mario form. Um, I started as a classroom teacher. I wound up working as a uh, director of technology along the way. Uh, I wound up working at the College Board for a hot minute. And uh, then I worked for the White House, which I always have to caveat, and especially in these days, I worked for the Obama White House. Um, <laughs> yes, uh, as a presidential innovation, yes, thank you. Uh, <laughs> Okay, we'll talk later. Um, and uh, along the way, my passion has always been in, in ed tech. So the idea of the marriage of technology and education. And um, I, I had started a company called Edutecker, which was a resource for teachers to find free tools for them to use in their classrooms. And the other resource I started about five years later was called Educlipper. The idea was that students can curate and collect resources, share them with their teachers, create digital portfolios of their learning. And then, as luck would have it, I wound up going on to be the co-founder of Breakout EDU, which I'll talk a little bit about later. Uh, most importantly, the best job I have is being a dad, and I'm the co-founder of these little guys over here. That's, uh, yeah, Hunter and Reed. And uh, I want to frame the conversation real fast. So my expertise in gaming has been the fact that I was a nerd who played lots and lots of games. Uh, in education, I used games, and I'll get into that a little bit as well. But I stand on the shoulders of giants here, especially in the education field. I mean, you could look at the work that, that way back when with Papert, and you could look at the work of, of Logo and Lego and all these different uh, organizations. But then you look at the work that's going on modern, uh, the modern work. So I'm inspired by the work. Uh, Steve, Steve Isaacs over here, over there, and, and Matt Farber. Yeah, I mean, th these are people that are doing amazing things, sharing them out, writing, and kind of uh, letting the roadmap be for the other people. So. All of you in the room, I don't know many of you, but I'd like to say it's not a one-way conversation, despite the fact that I stand here at a podium. I'd love for you to get involved. Keep calm. Feel free to tweet on. Hashtag for the day is G4C18. My uh, Twitter handle is very complicated. It's at Adam Bello. Um, if you don't know how to use Twitter, here's a tutorial for you. Get out! I'm sending you a tweet! Tweet! That's not how it works, Grandpa. <laughs> ah, a reply! I'm trendy! <laughs> yeah, so there you go. Uh, we're here because we love games and we love to see what the power of games uh, have for other people. And whether you're playing Dungeons and Dragons, um, any Dungeons and Dragons players here? Awesome, yeah, there you go. Uh, or whether you're playing a toilet, I have a Candy Crush, I always call them toilet games, um, you know, for that quick dopamine hit. You guys probably remember the first Nintendo game, what was it? First Nintendo game? It was a Mario. What? It wasn't Duck Hunt. Thank you for setup, though. That was good slide planning. We'll pay you later. Uh, it was actually a card game because Nintendo, of course, started as a playing card company. This was their first game. Uh, I've never played it either. But uh, games have been around for a long time. Uh, this is, uh, you know, the, the history of gaming is when a lion played with a goat, a ram. Uh, it was called Senate or Passing way back when. But, you know, some of my fondest memories are playing games as a child, whether it be at home with my parents or grandparents or with my sibling. Um, you know, and, and my fondest memories right now as being a dad is actually enjoying games with my kids because it's different than the other learning experiences that we have, right? Where it's like, clean your room. Um, <laughs> this is a little bit different. And in classrooms, you know, there was gaming as well. Uh, I had some teachers who felt that games were flashcards, right? It was, oh, it's review. And when I went to the computer lab, there were many important games where, for example, Oregon Trail. <laughs> How many people died of dysentery here? There you go, good, all right, excellent. It's a rite of passage. I want all children to die of dysentery, that's terrible. <laughs> Don't quote me on that one. Um, so then you played games like uh, Reader Rabbit and Math Rabbit, Math Blasters, shooting up, you know, uh, number munchers, math word, okay. I see some nods. Usually I show this one, people are like, I don't know what the hell that is. Um, and of course, we all solved crime with Carmen, um, going around and learning about different historical things. I still think that a lot of my geography knowledge does come from Carmen San Diego, um, <laughs> limited as it may be. And then, you know, teachers, they got real creative and they were able to do things like Jeopardy through PowerPoint, which uh, was a big hit. How many people have made a Jeopardy through PowerPoint? How many people have played a Jeopardy through PowerPoint? That separates the ages right there. Thank you very much. <laughs> But kids are born gamers these days. This is my son backing me up on rock band. Yeah, he was terrible backup vocalist, but it's fine. 
And then, of course, Pokemon Go two years ago took the world by storm. The most interesting thing about Pokemon Go to me is that it got lazy children to move around. For example, my children who complained to walk around the block said, can we go catch Pokemon? We'll walk to the library, which is four blocks. So that's four times the amount that they ever wanted to walk. So um, they did walk, though, and they walked about almost three million miles were logged in the first six weeks of release from Pokemon Go, which is kind of amazing to think that things like that can motivate children to actually move. We've seen a huge trend in education with Minecraft, right? We've seen people come on to say, okay, let's embrace a world where we can build and share and create and join together. And I think that it's fascinating. When I first saw the pixelation of Minecraft, I was like, what? Really? Fascinated. I loved it. It reminded me playing the Sierra turntable, uh, turn-taking games that I played with. And now the biggest craze, of course, is Fortnite. I'm trying to figure out why people are loving Fortnite so much. It's like, okay, it's great. Any Fortnite players here? Yeah, a couple. Okay, cool, cool. Well, you guys have to school me on it. Uh, speaking of school, I went to school to be a teacher at Hunter College, and uh, while I was there, one of the things we had to do was work with students with disabilities. That's what I was, well, we didn't have to do that, but that's what that we were doing because I was studying to be a, a special education teacher, and I gamified my class. Um, this is a game that I painstakingly made during the weekends. Um, <laughs> this is Manhattan Math. It is gorgeous looking, if I do say so myself. It really wasn't, but spent a lot of time on it, but it sucked. And the reason it sucked is because it wasn't fun. This was not a good game. This was math questions. When you rolled the die, you moved that many numbers, you picked it up, you did a math question, then you got to do it again. And guess what? <laughs> the, the lipstick on the pig was, was fairly thick, and the, the kid that was playing the game totally knew. I was like so devastated after three questions in that this kid was like, wait a minute, this is terrible. You know, it almost got to the point where I don't even have to roll the dice. Let's just keep asking the questions if that's what we're going to do here. We know the gamification and, and, ch and embracing games in the learning is actually a lot richer and deeper than that. There's many aspects that you can latch on to to kind of embrace curriculum, but also to allow kids to explore and grow as people. And I think that that's kind of uh, the, the way I'm coming to this, this talk. It's a really cool time to be a teacher. It's a wonderful time to be a learner as well. And I think that if we embrace some of the games that we have and some of the new games that people are trying to come out with and create and, and make available to children, that we will make classrooms better. The modern version of the Jeopardy in the classroom is a game system Kahoot. Very easy to do. You can work on a mobile device. You get kids uh, answering these quick questions. And it's timed and it's competitive and kids really like it. It's the candy of the gaming world, right? Um, and it is fun. I mean, they started as a movie theater trivia company. So, which makes total sense when you hear that you're like, oh, that makes, yeah, exactly. Um, then you can go and see games like Chem Caper. Have you guys seen this? Chem Caper? So, Chem Caper, I was doing, you know, in preparation for this, I was trying to find some really interesting deep dives into the gaming space. And this is a game that I think was on Kickstarter originally, but it wound up getting funded and being produced. You can get it on uh, iOS and Android, I believe. And this is a game that is, you know, your, your traditional game. When I looked at this, I was like, oh, my kids would totally play this. But they're working with, you know, chemical bonding and, and uh, you know, covalent bonding and all these different things to do with chemistry that I definitely am, uh, it's above my, my brain level. You have games like Classcraft. So Classcraft is a way to actually convert your entire gaming, uh, the entire classroom experience into kind of a gaming, uh, a gaming world where you're creating a character and you're getting XP points and as you learn things you move up. And what I find really cool about it is that, you know, they've evolved to have things like quests. So the idea is that they're gamifying the, the idea that your lesson plan is not just a series of points, you go from A to B. Um, new things like analytics where, where teachers can actually see the entire school moving along and making progress in SEL and uh, you know, a marketplace where you can kind of get these modules. And uh, Breakout, which I'll talk about in a bit, is actually one of those partners to, to give modules to their, to their games. Let's go back to Minecraft for a second because it's one of those things where I've really enjoyed seeing how deep the roots of Minecraft go in the education space. Um, they're, the resources that Microsoft has poured into Minecraft is really commendable because they're constantly coming out with supportive lesson plans and really getting people not only started using their product, which it is a product that you do pay for, but the reality is they're coming up with really good content that not only embraces it from the teacher's perspective of how to do it, why to do it, but, but just pouring a lot of, of uh, thought into getting kids excited about learning in this new way. Uh, I was lucky enough to go to a, a Minecraft education event 
uh, about a year and a half ago. And one of the people that was there was, was Adam Clark, Wizard Keen in the Minecraft community. And he got up there and he just blew my mind with this <laughs> demo. This is made out of Minecraft bricks and it's a working representation of the organs of the body. And he was flying around and explaining how he'd use this and teaching kids. And you know, for me, who at the time had very little working knowledge of Minecraft, and basically you know, knew the, the basic uh, how-tos, but when I saw this, I was like, wait, <laughs> you built that? And that's what you do with it? And there's a lot of really cool things. Uh, I was lucky enough to go to an event, uh, Steve Isaacs and, and a bunch of uh, his amazing team does an event called Mind Fair, and there's a whole bunch of them throughout the country. I think there's one coming up in Jersey, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, Mind Fair, give it up. Uh, and Mind Fair is great because it's basically, you know, you have all these kids that are interested in building with Minecraft, and they get to come. And my favorite thing that I saw there, there was lots of really cool stuff, and um, you know, they met all the characters and the YouTubers and all this stuff, but my favorite thing was a section set up with all these different laptops and it had Minecraft installed and this sign next to it said, adults take a seat, children teach your parents. And I thought that was great because I guarantee you there were many parents there that were like, oh, it's a Saturday, I'm taking my prepubescent teen with me to this thing. And they got to learn and experience with them. And, and the, you know, the integration goes deeper. I think that they really have, have honed in on how to make this a malleable tool. And that's what the beauty of Minecraft to begin with, the fact that you can kind of turn it into whatever you want. Even a periodic table of real elements, Minecraft style, paying homage to the Minecraft periodic <laughs> table of elements that I'm sure you've seen. Despite all that, we still have some old school problems. And they were problems that uh, you know, my co-founder and I were trying to address. So one of the problems is this. Bueller. Yeah. Bueller. Right. So Bueller. when I ask my kids Bueller. what they do at school, I get the answer that you Bueller. absolutely expect. Here. Right. Or some view school has this. <laughs> Compliance, right? And people will say, all right, well, that's not in the movies. That's a gross exaggeration of reality. The truth is it's not. Um, there are still many classrooms that are set up in rows, even in stock photos, kids look bored, you know, like this is, <laughs> um, my, my kids, prepare, this might be very loud, um, um, my kids go to a traditional school, which I'm very proud to say that they go to public school, but it's very much a traditional school, and what I mean by that is they spend most of the day engaging in the front of the room, trying to stay awake and uh, keep moving through their curriculum, and as an educator, my biggest fear is that there will be kids sitting in their classes, including my own children, saying, well, only 12 more years, I'll put this in cruise control and I'll just figure out how to, how to ride the system out. And that's not right. It's not right for kids. It's certainly not right for teachers. It just makes it boring for both ends of the equation. So we decided it was time for something different. And I will say that I'm going to now talk about Breakout EDU. I am the co-founder of the company. I'm not asking you to buy anything or try anything. I just want to kind of talk about some of the really interesting things that we've seen from building this product out and developing it. Does anyone know Breakout, by the way? A couple of folks? Cool, cool. Um, so for the rest of you, uh, it is based on the concept of Escape the Room. Uh, about three years ago, James Sanders, who's my co-founder, went to an escape room in Canada. Um, he called me the next day and described the experience, and I'm like, that sounds insane. I'd love to go see one. And the idea was kind of born from there. Uh, escape rooms, as most of you likely know, being at a games conference, I would imagine that most of you know the escape rooms, you get locked in a room, you have 60 minutes or some allotted amount of time to search for clues, think about what they could be to answer questions, solve those, and get out of the room. And uh, that gave birth to the idea of Breakout EDU. We're an immersive learning games platform. The first iteration was going to be, great, we'll just do that in school. We'll lock kids in classrooms. And <laughs> we, we, re we realized, yeah, we realized fairly quickly that that was not going to be uh, a very good idea. Um, so we came up with a different idea, which was to create a box that locks with a hasp. Um, and we threw multiple locks on it, and that's what we started with as an idea. We had three games that we came out with, and we sold this kit that you can go on and, and create these games for your classroom. The boxes were made in, you know, by hand, out of wood, in a garage. This guy, Mark Hammonds, who's on our team, he's the director of uh, uh, global initiatives and data. He goes and make, he made boxes in his garage, and we sold them out of there. It's your very you know, Silicon Valley-esque idea, right? Uh, but we're mission-based, and the mission of the company is that it, we're going to provide educators tools and resources needed to create immersive, engaging activities, learning experiences for their students. And 
that, that vision is changing. So what is it? Well, as I said, it's an immersive learning games platform. The games that we do are all based on physical and digital gaming. So there are some games that are solely physical, some that are digital, and some that are a hybrid of both. And we appeal to players of all ages. It's a malleable platform where we want everyone to be able to use communication, collaboration, creativity, critical thinking, the four C's, uh, to open up this box. So to do it, you'd get a kit. We have instructions on our website about how to set up games. You'd set it up and you'd play it. And at first, that's as simple as it was. That's the idea. We're going to make this thing where people can play games. And people say, well, what's in the box? What's in the box? <laughs> Thank you very much for laughing at that. Um, so what comes in the box is a series of, of standard items. It's, you know, everyone's like, oh, I want the science game. It's like, no, they're all exactly the same. Uh, it comes with items that are resettable. Because the idea was, let it be like a Nintendo. Let it be the platform that you can play anything else on. So it comes with a Red Lens Viewer and some other like, you know, escape room type stuff, but locks that you could set any way you want. And they're all resettable. The idea was, you know, what's the motivation? In school, why would you, you know, think about the concept of this. Escape rooms, at least, they're themed. You walk in, it's like there's a tomb, there's smoke machine, and some of them. You know, there's, there's lights blinking, there's some cool stuff. You walk into a classroom, there's a box sitting on the desk. The motivation is not a report card. It's not a grade, but I, a lot of students, right? I mean, this is the motivation, to get a good grade. In school, is very different from in gaming. In gaming, you work up to the boss level, right? Like, you get to the final battle with the bad guy. In education, <laughs> you work up to the final battle with the multiple choice test. And uh, <laughs> it's not as exciting uh, <laughs> to do that. So we have this idea, you put a box in the classroom, a locked box, and it's all story driven, right? So there's, there's hundreds of games that you can play. There's 675 different games. Um, they're all different subjects and areas, whatever. But the beauty of that is not that, oh, we have set games for you to set up in your classroom. The fact is that the platform is malleable. And what we found is the most important thing about this is that you can make this your own. And we saw teachers of all different content areas being able to take this idea and being able to create experiences for their classroom that was getting their students actively excited about coming to class and learning. So we decided to build a GDK, which is a really fancy way to say that we have a game developer kit, hashtag series of Google documents and forms and printouts and stuff, that take you through how we created some of our games. And this has evolved over time because we have amazing, amazing community of learners and leaders that are creating their own games, and students, I should say, as well, that, are, that have helped us reshape some of the templates and tools that we have to create good games and share on the platform. We're out to prove that learning and fun are not antonyms, although some schools seem to think that you can't say we're playing a game today. We found a lot of, of schools are still like, oh, well, that's great. We're not having fun. But if you look at this picture, this was my son's second grade class. He's not in the picture, so uh, you don't have to find him and give me an ooh. Um, <laughs> but kids were really having a blast. And the byproduct of this, you know, again, we, we came up with this concept, oh, it'll be really fun. Oh, it'll be great. There's learning involved. Every single game relies on the following. Teamwork. You have to have kids working together. They have to talk to one another and communicate. They can't be, you know, shouting out all the answers and taking charge. They have to have a team effort. They have to collaborate. Critical thinking. We don't have worksheets that have been gamified. So it's not like, oh, here's a lock. There's five digits. You have to add up these five numbers and put it out there, and that's the number. We want really complex critical thinking to go on where kids are really putting together a lot of their thoughts and then solving these problems creatively. One of my favorite things when I facilitate these games is to watch a kid come up with the wrong answer in the most beautiful way I've ever seen. They come up with like what would have been an amazing clue that's 25 times harder than anything we have, but the thinking process is just fascinating to watch on their end. Um, so we use the four C's. The other piece of the equation is teachers can get out of the way. You know, every conference I go to, I hear people talk about teachers being sages on the stage versus guide on the side, which is like an old tired saying. Now. This platform is really the fact you cannot get involved. The idea is that you get out of the way and let the kids have active ownership of their learning. The other thing is seat time. Tired of, bless you, tired of people sitting in seats and in rows constantly. So it is literally active learning as well. This is a game being played. You know, these people have had a lot of coffee. Um, so everyone's moving around. They're making new groups. They're forming small groups. They're working together. The other thing that we found is that as a facilitator, teachers often 
intervene too soon. When I was a teacher, all I wanted to do was help my kids, and helping my kids meant I had to keep up with the curriculum, and I had to intervene. You look like you're having trouble. The answer is four. Do you understand? Nod. Okay, good. We're going to go on now because everyone else has to continue. And that is absolutely removed here because we have the idea of kids knowing when they need help and giving us the hint card. You know, like in an escape room, you can ask for the hint and the game master will come in and give you that. Over here, it's like we give you two hint cards and you ask for it. And as a teacher, you're watching the kids learn and seeing every single aspect of their, of their creativity and their thinking. And you know that, oh, that student needs to go talk to that student because they already have the answer. They just haven't really communicated together. So you're able to kind of put those things together in the situation. Failure is really important. And, and in learning, we often look to avoid failure in classes. We don't want kids to fail. We want them to be successful. So success uh, is said by Churchill to be the ability to go from one failure to another without a loss of enthusiasm. And we love to see that in our games because it is literally a failure every time a kid pulls on a lock and it doesn't open. It's the same thing as a teacher saying to them, nope, that's it, you're wrong. And most of the times kids say, oh, I'm wrong. All right, forget it. Do I still get a B? Am I all right? Or, you know, over here, though, they are driven to say, okay, I need to open the box, I need to get in, because it, respecting their failure allows them to embrace that curiosity and, and have that experience. At the end of the game, we love to celebrate win or lose, and that's the best part of this as well, because the idea is that we're not, we're not celebrating the fact that they were successful, we're celebrating the actual learning experience itself. And so some people might say, well, it looks like fun, where's the learning piece? We do look at standards. And we align things to standards because that's what people need to justify using things in classrooms these days. But if you read some of the standards, it becomes very clear that you don't even have to do all the alignment. For example, in math practices, make sense of problems and persevere in solving them. Well, by definition, that's pretty much what we do in all, <laughs> in all the games. And you, I'm not going to read all these standards to you, but the idea is that this is the type of learning that, that what was trying to be achieved by setting forth such standards. And it's a very easy activity to do. One of our favorite things is that we got together as a team, and we're a team of five former educators, I wanna say. Like, it's all former classroom teachers that kind of got together and realized the, the power of what we're doing. Um, one of the things is the debrief. So we came up with these deck of cards. If you thought a box filled with locks was an amazing, innovative product, a deck of cards with questions on them will really just blow, blow it out of the water. Um, so we came up with a debrief. We don't, the learning does not end when the game is opened and the box is open. We don't want them to be candy in the box. We want it to be an intrinsic experience for the kids to own that learning and really want to get in by themselves. And so what we have is this deep discussion as to the learning. But for me, as an educator, as a parent, the most amazing thing has been some of these unplanned outcomes. And the, the, the idea, you know, we never started to say, oh, we're gonna be a four C's gaming company. We were a game company. We were making games that we knew would be fun in the classroom. But what we found almost instantaneously is that kids, all different types of kids, would gather together and be able to communicate and work together collaboratively. And as the father of a child with special needs, Knowing time after time, I've, I've read emails from teachers that are saying, oh, we have, you know, we're an inclusive classroom, but there's a few kids in the class that never speak, they never work with anybody else. They're finally working together. Like this was a great activity, not only to break the ice, but to actually engage them uh, as a learner, to give them respect and have them input into the game. So it's inclusive in that way. And that is really a very special thing. We see kids that might not want to work together being put in a situation where they must, and where that's the activity, that's the action. It's content-based, but at the same point, it's really people-based as well. It's inclusive. It's inclusive for all different types of kids, and it's all different ages, and it's funny because we originally thought, like, the first games were for high school kids and adults. We were like, this is a great model for PD to get people together, it's great for high school kids. But one of the funny things that happened is that we had a second grade teacher start writing games for her kids. And she was not alone in this activity, but she kept on doing it, and we hired her as the director of games. And we now have games for literally every single grade level. And it's, it's that idea that people have a voice, not only a voice in terms of the gameplay itself, but teachers are able to create and curate and communicate and put together these games to share them with a broader community. Um, we have a Facebook group with about 26, uh, 27,000 educators that are constant. It ruined my Facebook feed, by the way. Like, you, invite, you create something where 27,000 people are talking about it all day. It's like, I want to see pictures of like my nephews and my sister's kids. And it's like, oh, I have this great idea for a game. And I'm like, that's amazing. <laughs> where's, where's the pics? Um, so 
The, um, the other piece of it is that you have kids kind of discovering thinking in a very different way. I've gotten a lot of emails from students. I actually got a letter in the mail a few weeks ago from a student that said that it was the most fun he's ever had in school. He's in fourth grade. So we sent him a kit and we were like, yeah, during the summer, just make some games and you can have fun next year too. Um, but embarrassingly, this is, this is probably our favorite slash least favorite story. Um, we got, a, there was a tweet that said, you know, this kid broke his arm during recess but refused to go to the doctor because they knew we were playing breakout right after. So as a parent, I feel kind of weird about that one. Um, but but we, we've, seen, we've seen a lot of these things um, fall out of what the work that we're doing. And we've really taken a, a look at the landscape of learning as it's evolved. And so what we wanted to do was kind of build out tools for teachers to kind of embrace this in a different way. So we had recently launched a platform where teachers had access to, to building digital games. And inevitably, you know, people were like, oh, you should make one for students. And it's like, yes, we were. We just weren't able to tell them at the time. So we're about to launch this idea where students can get accounts under their teacher and then create their own games to share in the classroom. And our theory there is that, yeah, awesome. So thank you. So the real, the real cool part there is, is threefold, I guess. One is as a teacher, you don't have to own the creation piece anymore. The students get to actually create. And what I love about that is that what's more challenging, taking a test on you know, uh, the, the, the history of Egypt or building a game based on your mastery and then watching your friends struggle through playing it. Because the idea is that a teacher can get your game and if I assign that as the, the project that we're doing for this session, we're going to all turn in games on different topics. There's a game library for the class where all the kids can play those games. More importantly than just saying, oh, we have a tool that lets you build games, like a Jeopardy PowerPoint builder. We're launching a full course that explains how and why to design games and clues and put pedagogy behind it, because we know that that's really the most important piece of this equation. We want kids to be at that top level of blooms and actually start creating. So if you want, you could obviously get more information about Break.edu at the website. There's lots of stuff there. I'm gonna stick around for the day. I would love to answer any questions if you guys have them. But I always end with this quote because I really think it's the truest thing as educators that we need to remember is we must realize that the students are not in our classroom, we are in theirs. So thank you guys so very, very much. So I do have three minutes, unless you guys want to like get back on schedule. I'm looking at the games for change people. Someone raise their hand. Oh, you have a question? Yeah, go for it. Hi, my name is Hugh and Kwan. I'm from University of Rhode Island. I'm a PhD student in uh, the business school. Awesome. Uh, supply chain management, but I am focusing my dissertation research on gamification. So uh, one of my research topic is the educational setting in the university level. And I've been teaching for five semesters now, and I have been giving midterm and uh, final exams in a first finish 10 questions individually and get grouped up and uh, do a multiplayer session. And I recently discovered your platform and wanted to, uh, you know, <clears throat> explore some possibilities um, for university level application. Are you interested or have you uh, seen uh, yeah. application at the university level. Yeah, yeah. So we definitely have seen application at university. I'd be happy to, to chat more about that. Yeah, we have, we have games that are literally go K to gray, you know, like all the way, um, you know, everywhere in between. Thank you. Yeah, I'd be happy to talk afterwards. Right, thank you. Yeah, sure. Any other questions? And to preempt it, happy to talk to anybody. Um, if that's, yeah, I like your shirt. Thank you. Um, I'm Ibrahim Musel. I'm a um, professor at SUNY Polytechnic Institute in Utica, New York. Cool. Um, I teach a program in game design. Um, we have a class in gamification, and we had um, one year we had our students build games for um, a uh, pre-kindergarten kids to get them ready for kindergarten. And of course, our students, not being educators themselves per se, more game designers, didn't really understand, you know, the capabilities of a pre-K 
um, student and how, what you know what their game should focus on. So um, I'm a little bit curious to ask um, what lessons have you learned about the design of your games from those in within your community and um, <coughs> and um, those who have purchased your product in terms of trying to what. Are, do you have any um, very big do's and don'ts in terms of the designing of a breakout game? Yes. So the answer is yes. Uh, on the slash create page that I showed before, it's breakoutu.com slash create, um, we actually have a whole bunch of video tutorials and um, supporting materials that go through how to make a good game. Again, it, it's specific to our platform, but at the same point, those principles would exist for anything that's gamified, right? So. Um, you know, not on the nose, you know, there's a lot of, and we go deep into examples of, of different clues and ways that we've used uh, different questions and turn that into a breakout game. So happy, check that out and, you know, if you have any questions, let me know. Any last questions? Oh, sure. Got time for one more. You're the winner. I'll try to keep it simple. Uh, are your products available worldwide? Yes, they are. Excellent. There you go. All right, thank you guys so much.